Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nico Marzano. I do cinema here at the ICA and uh, founder and curator of Frames of Representation. Uh, it's a joy uh, to be here tonight uh, because the last time that we actually um, had an in-person edition of Frames of Representation was uh, two years and a half ago, April 2019. So uh, we had a few hiccups on the way uh, to get here tonight. Uh, but it's really uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, tonight, which is the opening of Frames of Presentation. Uh, the festival will continue until uh, Saturday, the 4th of December. Uh, we tonight present the opening night film, uh, A Night of Knowing Nothing, uh, by Payal Kapadia. Uh, and if you bear with me for two, three minutes, uh, uh, we will talk about this film in, in this introduction. And we will also uh, welcome Payal as she deserves. An incredible film. Uh, I know that too often, you know, uh, we say that, you know, in order to, but this is a special film that uh, uh, incarnates also the, the, the principles of frames representation, and especially when it comes to that relationship between aesthetics and politics. And, and when you will watch the film, you will understand. Not to mention that Payal uh, is her debut feature film, I went to Cannes in July won uh, uh, the award as best documentary for, for this film. So uh, her career is starting uh, uh, pretty solidly. But to go back to, uh, to uh, Frames of Representation, we are presenting 20 films uh, across these nine days. I hope you will be with us for these nine days. We will be here, we will be in the theater, we will be uh, in the ICA canteen to create that spirit of community that uh, you know, I, I can see a lot of familiar faces uh, uh, hopefully you know and you feel when it comes to this uh, festival. Um, the festival this year was uh, curated uh, uh, with uh, the thematic focus of reimagining. So what we wanted to reimagine and what we uh, were thinking like, you know, to reimagine while selecting these films and wi while watching these films was the idea of thinking of the cinema of the real, a cinema that r departs from reality as a cinema that would uh, merge cinematic languages, uh, resisting certain categories and certain terminology, and find uh, his apex uh, in, in the idea that uh, fabulation and, uh, and observation and documentation comes together under the same act within uh, ethical boundaries, uh, also taking into account the idea of artistic manipulation uh, without being scared by the idea that uh, cinema is, you know, the art of manipulation in a way, no? even from the moment that we think about a concept or we think about uh, the editing process, for example. And it will be also a political festival, because Frames of Representation is the place where we want to think of cinema as uh, an art form that can change our life, makes us think, uh, and, and perhaps hopefully uh, leave a drop, you know, in this ocean of nonsense that is uh, at the moment, like, you know, society and, and, and what we are experiencing. Um, as usual, the festival will be also a, uh, a platform for other uh, disciplines. Uh, we are extremely, extremely proud that this year we struck a partnership with uh, Radio Alara, uh, Sonic Liberation Front, a group of uh, sound artists and sound platforms uh, mainly based in, in Palestine, but that their aim, their curatorial and political aim is to unify uh, the, 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 the sound of Middle East. Uh, they will be with us tonight for a sound performance of 45 minutes, very special in the theater, I see a theater. So I, I, I generally recommend you to stick around after the Q&A that Payal and I will uh, hold on stage after the screening of A Night of Knowing Nothing. And there will be also DJ set, party, drinks, uh, and celebration, because that is really uh, at the core of what we are doing, is to celebrate an art as cinema. Um, I just want to quickly, before calling Payal, thank our partners and supporters at uh, uh, Dutch Embassy, Italian Culture Institute, MUBI, uh, BFI Fan, uh, NFTS uh, with, uh, with Sandra Ebron, we are doing a beautiful uh, conversation with Roberto Minervini. I think Roberto perhaps is in, in the room as well uh, about his uh, journey as filmmaker on Saturday and also about his new journey as film producer because uh, Roberto is here and with his hat on for Dirty Feathers, a very important uh, um, film uh, about the experience of homeless people in El Paso, Texas, uh, that will play on, on Sunday. And I will really warmly invite you to, to come and, and sit with us at 5 p.m. Um, 
to continue just briefly before uh, dwelling on, on Payal and Item Know Nothing, uh, we will have a performance by Daniel Pruberg on, on Saturday, a symposium on, on Saturday as well, uh, and a very special live performance, live cinema, my first film by Ziyanger on Monday night. Uh, I invite you to come. But now I would like to, to, to really invite Payal, because Payal made a film that it's, uh, it's a masterpiece that moves from the uh, personal, you know, in pursuit of love, to the political dimension of her work in, in a very uh, special way. And we will dwell on these uh, special aspects of her filmmaking during the, the Q&A. Y you will be part of it, part of this conversation. But uh, for now, please uh, put your hands together to welcome Payal Kapadia. Thank you very much for that introduction and for having the film here, A Frames of Representation. Um, thank you all for coming. I don't think I've had such a big audience before, <laughs> so it's really nice to see. And uh, I'm going to be here at the end of the screening for the Q&A, so I hope you will all stay for that. Uh, so thank you. I prefer not to say too much about the film, so you can see it with no expectations. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Please uh, welcome back to the stage, Payal Kapadia. So just some quick housekeeping before we uh, will dive into this uh, beautiful film. Uh, we are uh, audio and video recording this uh, conversation, this Q&A. So please, when we will open up to you, if you can wait for the mic so that we will have uh, some recording also of your uh, uh, question. Uh, I will start this conversation uh, with Payal, and then we will come to you. So please uh, get ready and, and share with you uh, your thoughts and, 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 and questions for a night of knowing nothing. Payal, thank you so much for being with thank us. You. It uh, was a bit of a, um, a journey no? to get you here, uh, figuratively, but also practically. So we are absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, <coughs> first of all, I want to say something that I always thought, you know, after watching the film in Cannes, uh, what a beautiful title, no? Such a, an understatement, you know, it's a life of knowing nothing, a night of knowing nothing. It, it, it's really a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, title. Um, I would like to start, like, you know, from actually from the beginning of the film, no? The, the film... Uh, starts as uh, uh, an investigative uh, uh, fictional piece of storytelling uh, with this art into love, into relationship, into the pursuit of love, and then moves into, into this resistance, political resistance of students, and so, um, and addresses wider issues like, you know, in, in, uh, in that complex society, which is the Indian society. And I would like to hear from you, first of all, where and, and when you felt the, the necessity, the urgency, you know? It's a film that pulsates with urgency of making this film. And how did you find this structure, no? From this investigative, fictional to more political. Yeah, thank you all for staying. It was really nice to see. Um, yeah, so the film, I think before this, I wasn't making films that were overtly political like this. But I think sometimes you get pushed into a certain situation and it makes you you have to shoot uh, what's going on. So I was part of the film school, and we were on a strike for 139 days. And uh, we started shooting then. And But along with that, we were also shooting our friends, doing a lot of interviews and taking intimate moments. But there was really no clear thought as to what the film would be. Uh, this was in 2016. It was a long time ago. and. Uh, so we were just, me and my partner, Ronobir, who's the cinematographer and the editor of the film. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. But we were just kind of shooting what was going on, doing interviews with our friends, dance parties, and things like this as well. So there was no clear agenda, let's say. So uh, as years went on, and uh, things started happening around the country, there were protests in various universities. And a lot of our friends were shooting in those universities. So oftentimes you would meet and talk and you know we'd be like, we're making this film, but we're not really sure. 
uh, you know, what we're doing, and they would be like, okay, we've shot some things in JNU, we've shot some things in HCU, we've shot, you know, why don't you take some of the footage? So as years went on, we collected a lot of footage, and we shot more things, and it went on for five years. Um, and that's why I like to think of this film as also a found footage film, mm. because we started looking back at our footage also, and you know, sometimes it happens that uh, over time, you change as a person. So looking at your own footage becomes uh, like as if it was found. Um, so we started approaching the film as a found footage film. We have archives of you know family footages that we discovered on the internet. We had uh, YouTube videos, viral videos that all of us uh, that were very much part of our lives. So it became like this growing archive of found footage, uh, and so. This, this form sort of became a way to, to deal with all this growing memories uh, and this growing okay. archive. In, in this sense, actually, this leads also to, to an aspect, uh, uh, a formal aspect of, of your film that is incredible for me, is that uh, uh, nothing feels superfluous, no? Uh, and, and, you know, of course, this is a statement that I, 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 I carefully think about because it's a film that formally engages with different layers of cinematic languages. No? You have Super 16, uh, um, as you said, archival material, uh, film shot on iPhones, uh, CCTV, the CCTV footage. Is, is and I was wondering... Uh, um, I mean, why did you decide to, to adopt all, d you know, it, it was just that uh, uh, the political aspect of, of the film led you to wanting to use all that f for, for the substantial of contribution that those uh, materials were giving to you, or there was also a, a desire of connecting form with uh, politics? I think the desire for form is always there. Yeah. And this is what was really exciting also, because it was truly in that sense experimental. Uh, because, you know, we'd be editing the film, writing the film, doing everything at the same time. Mm. And the film was sort of made while editing it. So there was this aspect definitely of trial and error and a lot of failure. Um, and the, the letters were written by me and my, my colleague, Himanshu, uh, and we would be writing them and giving it to the editor, and we would be editing them and saying, this mm. really doesn't work, and you mm. need to... You know, so there are a lot of things that wasn't used in the film, finally. Uh, and so it was an exciting form. It was an exciting uh, process to keep trying and, and trying different things to, to put the film together. So, and I think the, the, the form of un, unsent letters was something that really excited me. Uh, you know, this discovery, yeah. like, you know, this kind of thing that you find these letters. Uh, and this sort of became the form of the film because it was also so much different kind of footage and how do you sort of put it all right. together even though we had shot it already with this grainy black and white image in mind but you know it's still hard to uh, how do you sort of you know make it all look like one hmm. so this was a struggle and finally we came with this form and uh, when it comes, like you know, to um, I mean, one of the uh, staying up for a while on, on, on the formal aspect. Um, when I saw your film uh, at the festival in, in Cannes, I, I definitely felt that not only it's an extraordinary film, the beautiful feature, uh, but also for me, as I was saying also sh before during the introduction, it's a film that uh, it's built around the relationship. Uh, between aesthetics and politics. No? For me, any form of cinema is political in essence, and you can find beyond what is the declared intention, political intention of the film, needs to be uh, investigated, addressed, uh, and, and looked at through the, the, the lens of the, the form. That, uh, and also your exploration of love in the film, in that sense, uh, looks at that. You know, you are saying letter that you are writing, and then linked also with the, the commentary from the students. Uh, but it's an expression of love in, in India and, and the problem of, of the caste, you know. Um, it came mo more from a need of wanting to talk about love or also to, to want to touch, like, you know, because I guess it's a bit delicate, no, as, as, as discourse. Uh, um. I think love in India is very political, but I think love everywhere is quite political. Um, so I think uh, I, it, it also was because of the beginning, how we were shooting our friends and yeah. uh, all the intimate conversations. Inevitably, we came to the question of love. 
or who you could be with or who you could marry. This was a general preoccupation amongst young people in India and I think everywhere. So we thought that we're making a film that has university students. This is something that is playing on everybody's minds. So definitely this, this idea of impossible love was something, but it's, it's everyday life. It's not something that you know, is just made up for the film. It's, it's, it's a struggle for everybody. So we wanted to have this aspect as one of the key components of the film. And I also think that if we want to talk about politics and we want to talk about political change, we really can't talk about it without talking about the social fabric that we live in. Mm. Political figures don't come out of the blue. They come because there's something going on in, 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 in the society that you live. And uh, India as a society is extremely, there's a lot of discrepancies with caste and class and even religion. So we felt that you know this, this story would be a kind of, it's also kind of self-reflexive mm. on the movements that we were part of because uh, the question of caste and these things, if, if we didn't address them within ourselves, I don't think we would be able to even get to the political change that we want because if they are not addressed, then you know, it, it's impossible. So I think the form um, and the content will really sort of meld it together with having this, this story. And in relation to, to, to the story, like, you know, f one aspect of the film that I found like, you know, uh, incredible in, in generating emotions and, and sentiments and feelings uh, and inspiring a reflection on a political level is uh, the soundscape of the film. You know? We move from silence to, uh, to conversations to voiceover. Uh, and all like you know it's weaved together in, in a very or harmonious way mm -hmm. so I was wondering if you could share with you uh, also like you know this this process of um, how you approach sound in your in your film yeah. um, I think the film was very sort of personal because all of us had lived through these times the the five years that the film I, I don't know if you can tell but the film is five years uh, of time no. in, in, in India so it was uh, something that all of us sort of experienced and was very emotional uh, time for everybody. Yeah. Um, but um, the, 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 the thing with the sound was that I, I was very interested in this idea of the sound to be not illustrative of the image, uh, but evocative of something which together with the image would create a third image in the mind of the audience. So it's never, sometimes it's quite, there's, there's no image sound coming out, there's nothing from the image and it's only the sound design or the lack of, or just the voice. So I was interested in this idea of how sound can work, but not in a way that illustrates what's going on, yeah. uh, but maybe creates a kind of a skin around uh, the images, which maybe evoke something that is more, um, that you know, like the feeling that it, that, that, that it finally evokes. Um, yeah, so I really like to work a lot with sound in this in yeah. this way and just the in the sense of like the tones and things like this how it can be something that you really feel uh, while watching and that was the intention no I, I absolutely and i think also that to you know what you talk about you know uh, it's it's about mystery you know your film is very mysterious and the soundscape of the film contributes to create that uh, uh, alia of mystery and also of melancholia for me, the film is, is coated in a melancholic mood, but you know we, we were uh, touching on this before. Um, but it's not like you know the, the melancholia can be also very, in my view, negative sentiment. And uh, when I say negative sentiment, I'm thinking of Mark Fisher, no, is the communism the idea that uh, what capitalism is stealing from us is the idea of looking forward or imagining a future, S staying stuck in the past. In your film, the past is used as a propellant fuel to act and within the film it happens within the film it's not something only that uh, then happens in our hearts or minds when we leave the film mm -hmm. so I was wondering if you could share some idea about uh, this nostalgia this melancholy because I think it's powerful no? yeah I think uh, even with the image the mm. texture and things has a sense of nostalgia it's a uh, well we were in film school so when we started shooting the film, so there's a certain romanticism to you know analog film. Uh, the aspect ratio is uh, square. So we had been watching a lot of you know like Soviet cinema. There's the reference to Eisenstein, uh, 
uh, and also French cinema. So we were very much influenced by you know this sort of black and white. Uh, it's a film school thing, I think all of mm. us had it. Uh, but I think what finally we started looking at it a bit differently as well, that to evoke a sense of nostalgia. Uh, but it wasn't really like a nostalgia for the past. Uh, but perhaps a nostalgia for the present, the kind of times that we're living in, and how it's forced a lot of us to uh, you know, become politically engaged, which many of us were not before. And circumstances and situations have forced all of us to, to become so. Mm. So I think even though it's been a really difficult time, it was also, I think, for us, like a kind of an awakening, a lot of uh, young people in India. So um, it was a sense of nostalgia and to evoke a sense of that. Like nostalgia is always associated, associated with something nice mm -hmm. and something wonderful as well. So I think we, we, we wanted to create that feeling, but it, it's not necessarily that about the past as mm -hmm. such, because this is a very, it's about contemporary times in India. So yeah, it was a bit of those things. Uh, speaking of, of contemporary times, absolutely. It is a film that you know, attacks quite frontally even with the, the making of, uh, of the images and the assembling of the images, what is India right now, no? from a political point of view, that you know, I've, uh, I've not been there, but you know, for what I read, I hear, I share from friends, it's a very you know, difficult society at the moment. Um, and your film, in that sense, is a political film. But one of the aspects that I absolutely respected and I was, uh, you know, I, uh, really inspired by is that never really uh, falls into the trap of being a propagandistic film. So I, I would like to hear from you, like, you know, these, uh, how do you uh, face and interact and address this dichotomy, you know, between uh, political cinema and film that can also be propagandistic? Uh, because the declaration of wanting to be political is uh, always problematic. You know, the moment that you declare something, you are taking away from your declaration, if you are genuine in your declaration. And your film, even though it is something also declared, but it's declared with a sensibility that, uh, you know, in the same instant that you declare, you also take away. So I would like to. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, all cinema is political. And even if somebody says that it's not, it's apolitical, that is also their politics. So, you know, there's no shying away from your political position when you make a film. I think um, so, but in terms of like talk, um, I think for us the film was very personal because it was you know everything that we were facing at a, on a daily basis. Uh, some of these images that you see, they were very much part of you know like things that were shared on Facebook and things like this. So it was that you were seeing them, you were seeing them happening. It was very common commonplace as, as such. I mean like because. But every time, like for example, the, the footage of the CCTV that you see uh, towards the end, when all of us saw it, there was such a, such a sense of like helplessness and so much shock. Mm -hmm. And also, it was, it, we, all of us were very, very moved by it and it, was, it, it caused a lot of protest all over the country. And it was one of those images that was really horrifying. So I think that position that we were experiencing is what I wanted to bring in the film as well, because it's not like something happening in some other country, you know, which you're totally disconnected from, but something that you can feel emotionally connected to as well. And this was sort of the, the, the aim in the film, to, to yeah. be able to bring out those feelings that all of us had, you know, when we saw these images for the first time and felt so horribly upset and, uh, and helpless. Uh, so I think, that sort of vulnerability <laughs> is what, it, I think that's the kind of person I am, and maybe that's that really reflects it, 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 it would be, I think it's okay to be vulnerable also, and that's that's fine. You might not be able to make great political discourse at times, but you can you can feel things, and that's okay too. Absolutely, and, and also, like, you know, on, on this line of, of the role of cinema and you as filmmaker and those students that uh, some, you know, like you, become filmmaker or some that want to be, there is also an interrogation of the role of, of an artist or filmmaker, no? In one of the voiceover, we hear clearly what is the our role. So there is this genuine desire of trying to 
not only feel moved and shocked by, by what we see, but also to, to interrogate what are the perimeters within which a filmmaker should, you know, or can do something. And, you know, I would love to hear more about this because I think it's... Uh yeah, I think, uh, well, the, the film school that I went to was a public-funded film school, so it was oh. like our national film school. So I think there were a lot of questions amongst us as to what is the responsibility when we've been, uh, you know, where you you had the privilege of firstly going to film school, uh, and then on top of that to be funded by the government, and uh, in a in a country where we need to speak about certain things. So uh, this is these are questions that we were always having, and the speech that comes at the end of the film, which is I think what you're referring to, was uh, interestingly given by my friend. Um, during a student union uh, meeting where he was talking to new students who had <coughs> just come to film school. Mm. So he was trying to sort of infuse this idea that, you know, that everything, every action that you're going to do is going to reflect on the collective of the film school as well and the student body overall. But also we need to be responsible for the films that we're making, the images that we're making, and what they're going to go out into the world and do. So I think... Um, it, it's. I, I I don't want to be like you know saying that this this is the only way, but to be able to find a position somewhere, you mm -hmm. can't say that you don't want to have a you, you know you want to completely like not have any position at all. So I think that's that was important for us to put into the film. But some people would also say that it's not political enough. You know, it's kind of saying that you know just look at things with nuance and not making. But like you said, mm -hmm. I was not interested in making like a film that was like was propagandist even though i think this is quite propagandist mm -hmm. no absolutely we <laughs> so uh, yeah so i think these are some of the questions that we are also dealing with on a mm. daily basis like how do you talk about some of these things and from the position that we come from each of us who are making the film so it's a complex thing and i think sometimes you fail and sometimes you think that you know it's 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 not uh, like you look back and you think that Maybe this is not what I meant at all, or maybe this is not what I wanted to say. But I guess it's a process, and we're always learning and trying to deal with this at all times. And your relation to this, also, I feel, you know, I, I would love to, to, to hear, like, you know, your relationship with cinephilia within uh, kind of the academic uh, journey that you uh, undertake, because this film also somehow reflects, I, at least I felt a lot of references, you know, the most immediate one, of course, is the use of montage, you were referring to the Russian school, but also Godard comes to mind, so I was wondering if uh, in these conversations, in these exchanges that you had with uh, the other students, with other colleagues, uh, it was taken into account and, and was somehow <laughs> transferred into the writing process and into the editing, and if so, uh, at what level? Influences from you know from yeah, your yeah. own cinema. I think like it was because we were in film school, uh, so <laughs> it's very much part of our lives. All the time we are discussing life through cinema, <laughs> so which is uh, which is kind of a privilege. <coughs> it's nice to be able to do that. Of course. So there there are a lot of references in the film to Ghatak. Uh, I don't know if it, uh, you're aware of the filmmaker Ritwik Ghatak. He's very important to us, and there are drawings of him on the walls. So I think because the film was sort of started off in film school, we had a lot of these uh, references uh, in the film mm, as well. Dwarf. And um, I was personally very influenced by Chris Marker and you know the letters uh, you know in uh, Sonsoli. So it was a form that was very exciting <coughs> for me to have this fiction, non-fiction idea. So I think, yeah, these things, I mean, if you're in film school, these things do come yeah. in part of it. We, we, were, we, were, we were also studying uh, cinema uh, <coughs> and looking at political cinema at the time. For example, in our editing classes, we were discussing like Eisensteinian montage and the, the editing of Griffith and, you know, what were their political positions and how the form was kind of uh, so reflective of their politics, even though one would say Griffith is not, you know, considered to be overtly political, but actually, if you see Birth of the Nation, it's, uh, I mean, it pretty much yes. talks, it, it, it gives the context to all of Hollywood cinema, no? Like this fear of yes, this sir. unknown entity coming to the, the, 
I mean, of course, Griffith did introduce editing in a way that we also follow now, but I mean, it's, it's extremely political. In fact, uh, it's because of Birth of the Nation that the Ku Klux Klan's outfits have been, you know, that they started wearing those outfits. So <laughs> it's for me very weird, <laughs> but um, it, is, it is that. So, and all of American Hollywood cinema has these like aliens coming to, you know, coming only to destroy America. But uh, so this, they always come only to America for some reason. <laughs> but it's you know this this sense that uh, so I think somewhere in the very beginning of yeah. you know understanding editing came from these two different perspectives of Eisensteinian montage and Griffith's montage and how over the hundred years of cinema history it's, it's informed by yeah it's it's still. And also, in, in this sense, uh, Payal, your film, it's a film that, you know, it's not only non-fictional. It's, it's a lot of things. It really opens up the realm of possibilities for the language of cinema. Yeah. That's a, not, it's not only stopping itself to the idea of, okay, let's address this story from a, a fictional, a non-fictional. I think it's much more than that. It creates its own language in creating a pace that is not easily recognizable. Uh, uh, this is, in a way, also like you know, when the aesthetics, in my view, and I would love to hear what you think, the aesthetics is not necessarily something that uh, has to be detected, you know, and has to be uh, categorized in, in something, you know, the pack and like you know, move from one way to the other and without uh, needing like you know to find like you know um, a consistency in that sense. So. Yes, because before, you know, I, I just made this point, because before you were touching about the idea of the division between fiction and non-fiction. Mm -hmm. Someone wrote today, actually, uh, about the festival, a little while I said, uh, it's time maybe to discard the terminology of documentary, you know? Uh, maybe, yeah, you know, maybe yes, or maybe no, like, you know, w what the term really means, you know, it's, uh, for you, what documentary means, what fiction, non-fiction means, I would love to hear, like, you know, more on, you know, not in relation only to this film, yeah. but your idea of cinema. Well, I think these lines are just, uh, for me, both are pretty much the same, non-fiction and fiction. It's just the approach uh, that you have for each of them. And uh, there really is no, um, no, there really shouldn't be actually much difference between it's, it's looking at a film and a film is a film. So, you know, whether you want to approach it through, I like to say like more fiction and more non-fiction <laughs> and somewhere in the degrees of these things, uh, the film is formed. Um, so I, I, yeah, it's, uh, these boundaries are pretty limiting and I feel that as filmmakers, we really shouldn't be limiting ourselves to these ideas. Uh, but just be able to to, to use the form um, to raise the questions that you want to, and that's more important. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, I watched this film that we actually program here because in the end of the film it's uh, it's interesting. It's a portrait of uh, one of the greatest, like you know, band, the Velvet Underground. You know, but the very first card in the film says. Uh, a documentary film by Todd Danes, uh, and then they already lost me. A documentary, just you know, impress me with a film, and then you know, I will you know think whether or not it's a documentary, uh, kind of a documentary. It's an essay. It can be everything. But anyway, uh, so sorry. I was thinking about this for a while because people have asked me like, oh, how could you use fiction and this sort of thing. So there was this uh, one of my professors at film school had said that, you know, if somebody points at the moon with their finger, don't look at the finger, look at the moon. So it's not about you know what is direct, how you're getting directed to it, but look at the image and look at what it is, and and that's what's important. Uh, is there yes, there are, ah, there are a few hands actually. Got kind of one in the, the middle, yeah. Hi, um, okay. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> better. And, um, about the roles of the dreams in the film, um, that there's both dreams and the level of the story. Um, so there's a two dreams um, that the character tells, both of which seem to have something to do with water. Um, there seems to also um, the dream. There's there's something dreamlike on the level of the storytelling. Um, there's something oniric about the way that the story is. Just wondering um, if you could 
little bit about the role that the dreams played. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, uh, well, this also sort of came from the initial, uh, the time that we were shooting our friends. People would like to talk about their dreams. And this particular dream that's in the beginning, the Mukul's dream, was something that he just told me. And I thought it just sort of worked with, you know, the sense of fear and uh, this father figure, uh, which is also the state um, coming to attack him because he was wanting to be with this woman that he loves. So this was the thing. But I also had the feeling that this whole film is kind of like a long night uh, and the dreams come and go. And there's also, you know, nightmares that are part of it. And maybe the title also is kind of speaking to that, a night of knowing nothing. So, and also like the title especially was something that, because when you're in the protests and when you're kind of, you know, going one day at a time, you really don't know what's going to happen next or how you are going to be thinking about these things as, as things move on. So there was a lot of confusion, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of vulnerability, anxiety, fear, all these things, and how do you sort of talk about that, like, uh, in, in, in such a short time? So we felt that having some of those anxieties and dreams um, that we had also felt, you know, during our strike uh, was something that we wanted to include. So it's not exactly from that time, but it's just generating that sense of fear and helplessness. Okay. Um, we are... Uh, Running out of time, also because as I said, I hope you can join us for this special per sound performance by Radio Alara and Sonic Liberation Front in the theater starting in 15 minutes. Uh, there will be also drinks in the bar as per usual. If you love this film, please remember that this film will be distributed in 2022 by ICA Cinema. So tell a friend if you, l you know, enjoy this film and uh, please join me in thanking Payal Kapadia.